Welcome to a special edition of Anglican Unscripted. This is episode 884. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm Julian Dobbs. And t- today is October 4th, 2024. All right, I'd like to welcome you all to another program of Anglican Unscripted. We're glad you could be here. If you get a chance, please click the like button and subscribe. Uh, The viewership is growing all the time. And we have uh, a 20% new audience just this year. And so you're seeing me introduce some new characters onto the screen. This is Bishop Julian Dobbs. And I thought I'd introduce him because he was given an assignment last week. He completed it. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, Bishop Dobbs, welcome to the program. Kevin, it's great to be back with you. Always good to share with your listeners and viewers and to talk about things about Jesus and his church. Okay. You are a bishop, and let's talk a little bit about your diocese when we before we get too uh, far along here. Cool. I'm honored to serve as the diocesan bishop of the Anglican Diocese of the Living Word. It's a diocese of the Anglican Church in North America. We've been part of the ACNA since its formation. And uh, I'm assisted in my ministry with two uh, assisting bishops, Bishop Bill Love, Bishop David Benner, and a great staff team of clergy and lay leaders who support me in my ministry. We have 43 congregations and missions, uh, predominantly up and down the East Coast, but some just a little bit broader than that. And uh, we're about the work of the gospel, planting churches, proclaiming Christ, and uh, upholding the mission of the Anglican Church in North America to transform this continent and beyond uh, with the transforming love of Jesus. All right. You and I met uh, many times before. In fact, I think the first time we had a conversation was in the great country of uh, Jamaica. Uh, we were down there it for... It long ago, Kevin. My it was goodness. so long ago. It takes us back a while. <laughs> no. I remember I that Anglican had... Anglican Council I... meeting in Jamaica. Yes, I had hair uh, back then. I, uh, I've probably lost a 50 pounds since then. But uh, in as such, uh, you have been around the world many times, and I've uh, traveled uh, with you and the other bishops from the uh, Anglican Church of North America and certainly the uh, archbishops from the Anglican Communion. So you're seasoned in your travel, and you have a good understanding of how foreign uh, national countries work. And I was not surprised when I read an email to uh, this week uh, from Steve Wood, the new Archbishop of the ACNA, who said, last week I dispatched Bishop Julian Dobbs, Chair of the Global Mission and International Relations Task Force, to visit Israel. He met with Jewish communities throughout Israel, Palestine, Palestinian Christians in the West Bank, and families of those directly affected by the October 7th terrorist events. Um, I just learned something new when I read that, and it was this new task force. Can you tell me a little bit about that before we talk about your trip? Archbishop Steve Ward is uh, committed to ensuring that the Anglican Church in North America fulfills its mission, both locally and globally. And he's a man that believes that Jesus still says go. When he commissioned us in Matthew, as we read in Matthew 28, to go and make disciples of all the nations. Uh, That's what we're doing here in North America and beyond. I'm very humbled that the Archbishop has asked me to serve in this capacity because we are involved in global mission. All Christians are involved in some sort of mission, whether it be locally or globally, to share the gospel. That's the task that Christ has given to us. And in the Anglican Church in North America, we're also desirous of continuing to establish and build strong global relationships for the gospel uh, right across the world. Uh, We're part of the Global Anglican Future Conference, GAFCON. Uh, Archbishop Steve sits at the GAFCON Primates table. And so we're involved globally as well as locally. And so he's asked me to take on this mission and also to work with our canons, the canons in the ACNA, who are doing a spectacular job at partnering in mission in various places around the world. So we're going to bring all of that mission together. We're stronger together and press deeper into those things as we seek to continue to share the gospel the Lord's entrusted to us. Mm -hmm. Uh, 
And part of this was to send you to Israel. We all know that uh, the Middle East is, for all intents and purposes, on the cusp of war. Uh, the tensions have been rising uh, certainly since October 7th of last year when uh, Hamas launched an attack on uh, Israel and you know some 1,800 people um, have been uh, killed in that attack and you know, hundreds of hostages taken. Um, where did you go and what did you do and what did you learn? First, uh, where did you go? Thanks for asking that question, Kevin. It was, it was important to the Archbishop that I, the first uh, trip that I make as his envoy would be to the Middle East, uh, mm -hmm. given the tensions in the region, but also given the significance of that region to us as GAFCON. GAFCON first began there in Jerusalem, and every other meeting we tend to go back to Jerusalem where we began. So mm -hmm. the Archbishop dispatched me uh, to uh, the land of Israel to meet with the people of Israel. Because let's think we've got a, a, colloid, a kaleidoscope of religions there, haven't we? We've got, of course, the Jewish people, we've got Islam, we've got the Yazidis, uh, we've got uh, the Palestinian Christians, um, we've got a huge growth of secularism across Israel. And my task was to go and um, minister to those people groups as best I can to say, in the midst of this incredible tension, you are not alone. The Anglican Church in North America is here. We're praying for you and we're attempting to hear from you what's happening for you in your circumstances. So I was privileged to be with uh, small Aramean Christian communities right up on the northern border with Lebanon. Those uh, communities are being targeted by Hezbollah rockets uh, to listen to their story, to pray together. Uh, down on the southern border uh, with Gaza, close to the Rafah crossing, I was able to meet with Jewish communities directly impacted from the October 7 massacre and listen to the story about how those um, dear people have attempted to uh, rebuild their lives. Um, the, the stories that they tell are chilling and they are horrific. Uh, I was able to meet with some members of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs associated with the Knesset, uh, receive a briefing from the Israeli Defence Force, worship with uh, the Christian community, with our good friend uh, David Pelegi and CMJ at Christchurch Jerusalem, and engage as much as I possibly can, uh, could, with people across the land of Israel. I talked to some uh, Palestinian Christians about how they've been impacted since October uh, the 7th last year, and what this whole intensification um, of the uh, situation in the region has meant for them and their ministry. So what did you learn? Well, I learned that, um, firstly, the situation is horrific. While we get some reports uh, in the West about what happened October the 7th, um, walking through uh, the site of the Nova Music Festival, where I left a note from the Anglican Church in North America, uh, uh, walking through uh, towns that were uh, invaded and massacred by people who only wanted to um, bring destruction and death was chilling to see firsthand. When I heard the stories of those who had lost loved ones, when I listened to people taking care of orphans whose parents had been killed uh, as a result of October the 7th, all of a sudden it becomes so much more real than it once was because we're dealing with human beings just like you and me, Kevin, uh, who are attempting to live their lives in peace and harmony, and all of a sudden, evil in some form uh, presses in on them and their lives are changed forever. And that's the first thing I learned. Listening to Palestinian Christians, I, I, I heard for them the, the importance to many of them for a strong Israel. They said to me, some of them, that Israel is the only country in the Middle East that allows people to choose and change their religion without fear of reprisal. And they said, as a result of that, we need a strong Israel in the region. Some of them said to me, if we lose Israel, if, 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 if Israel is weakened, then Christianity will come under huge pressure 
and we will not be able to practice our faith. And then obviously, Kevin, um, I'm thinking to my time in Bet Jala in the West Bank, um, uh, talking with Palestinian Christians there, whose life was already very pressured uh, as a result of the tensions in the Middle East, but even more so now where, where freedom of travel has been curtailed, where uh, Christians who have been involved in the tourist industry are struggling to put food on their table because Christians are not coming to Israel. It's just too unsafe to do so uh, at this time. And so uh, hearing all of these stories, praying with people, uh, uh, sharing with, with, with the people of the land uh, something of the love of God, simply by being present, uh, was a huge gift. And I'm very thankful to the Archbishop for sending me uh, to Israel at this time. Obviously, it came with its pressures. Um, Israel's under pressure. Rockets are being fired. It's not easy to get in. And for me, it wasn't all that easy to get out. But no. however... Uh, now tell me a little bit about that. How, how did your uh, trip affect you sa for safety reasons? Well, firstly, a lot of people were praying, and that was hugely significant. I was supported here by my staff team who had engaged people both locally and uh, uh, elsewhere to support me. That, that was helpful. Uh, and also, obviously, I was being guided by our people on the land who had put together um, a program for me to attempt to engage with as many people as possible. Uh, flights in were canceled just before I left, so I had to work, rework those. Flights out were canceled as I was about to leave. Uh, so fortunately, I found a route that was open that managed eventually uh, to get me back to the United States. Um, but it's fascinating, as I was as I was wrestling with those very personal things about travel, I recognized that 101 people are still being held underground in Gaza by a terrorist organization called Hamas. And while I was working hard to liberate and extract myself from uh, from the, the land of Israel. Uh, I thought of those 101 people still being held captive in Gaza. Some obviously who have been there for many years, the majority uh, since October the 7th, and their lives can only be described as hellish as a result of uh, those atrocities. Yeah, we're coming up here. It's going to be October 4th when this video is released. Um, that's 362 days they've been held hostage. And I can't think of another situation where mass people have been held hostage that long. Maybe uh, when the Iranians held uh, embassy employees of America hostage for some 400 days, that was uh, certainly uh, as bad. Uh, but they were videotaped every day and we knew their health. We don't know very much about the hostages being held in the tunnels right now by Hamas. So Some of those families, Kevin, have not heard anything uh, from uh, their loved ones for that whole yeah. day. They've not heard anything from their loved ones. And so this is a situation that's going from bad to worse. It's hugely intense for those families. I also had the great privilege before I went to Israel of meeting a number of of the released hostages at an event in Washington, D.C. I talked, for example, to Noah Agamani. She would be known to many of the viewers who was a young girl taken away by the Hamas terrorists on October the 7th on a bed of a motorcycle. She was released many months later, but her boyfriend still remains captive, as do so many others. This is very personal uh, and very real uh, for so many of those individuals and their families. Think of the families. Um, not knowing whether their relatives are dead or alive. And think of those who have been released, knowing that they've left behind in captivity many of their relatives and friends. Yeah. Um, I guess now the bigger question is you've gone there, you've certainly expressed uh, the love of the ACNA for the land of Israel and for the people suffering uh, under this horrible time of anxiety and uh, war in the Middle East. What do the people you've met with need from the ACNA? Well, firstly, we need to pray. And uh, Archbishop Steve Ward has called the Anglican Church in North America uh, this coming Sunday to pray a special collect which he has released in all the churches of the province. Uh, we'll be praying those prayers in my own diocese. Uh, I encourage all those who are watching uh, to pray those prayers 
and to bring before the people, not just the Jewish people, not just the Christians, but all the people of Israel, uh, bringing them before the Lord and asking for a resolve to what is only what is only an intensifying situation. So it's the first thing is that we need to pray. Secondly, we need to be informed. Uh, as you as you are well aware, people take a situation like this, and their natural default is to politicize the situation. Long before this is a political situation, it's a very personal situation for men and women and children whose lives on both sides of this equation will never, ever be the same again. So we need to be informed and recognize that this situation is firstly very, very personal. Thirdly, I'd suggest as we're informed this, that we understand that there is no place that exists in the church or in the world for anti-Semitism today. And the tragic rise of anti-Semitism, which we have seen across our nation and around the world, fueled by whatever and whom, whomever, can never and must never be tolerated in our societies today. And tragically, we continue to see that rise of anti-Semitism in so many places. So I'm asking people to pray. I'm asking people to be informed. I'm, I'm, I'm asking where you can take a stand against anti-Semitism. Don't tolerate it. Don't remain silent. Uh, none of us will change any circumstance with regard in October 7th by remaining silent. And then thirdly, do what you can to uh, cause other people to be aware of the situation. 101 people still being held captive in the tunnels of Gaza. It's time to bring them home, whatever the cost. Bring them home. It is never appropriate to incarcerate people against their will. Yeah, for over uh, many millennium now, we've tried uh, solutions through states, through treaties, through peace talks, and I think it's now time just to get on our knees and uh, pray for the Middle East and pray for Israel. Uh, we tried it our way, let's try it God's way, and I think it's that time. I want to thank you so much, uh, Bishop Dobbs, for your time on Anglican Scripta today and telling us about your trip. And uh, we wish you uh, uh, much success with your new assignment on the, this uh, task force. It would be interesting to, to get some updates as time passes. But thank you again for being on the program. Thank you, Kevin. It's always good to be with you. God bless you and those who support you.